In just over 200 years, we've become the greatest nation in the world, with the most powerful economic, political, and humanitarian force in history. Through ingenuity, hard work, and common sense, we've forged a strength and a spirit that has advanced the cause of humankind. From the electric light bulb through the silicone chip to the first man on the moon and beyond, the United States has led the way. We've captured the energy of the sun and the wind. We're exploring the far reaches of the solar system. We can replace almost every major organ in the human body, and we can manipulate the molecules of life itself. Important breakthroughs in bioengineering, electronics, laser technology, computer technology, fiber optics. The list seems endless. Throughout our short history, we have consistently seized the challenges of our dreams and turned them into realities. But there is one most important dream yet unfulfilled, the dream of peace on Earth. That same ingenuity that gave us lasers and organ transplants has also given us a military capability beyond human imagination. There are right now 50,000 nuclear warheads in the world. Just one of our 37 strategic submarines carries more explosive power than was detonated in all of Europe and Japan during World War II. Yet, we can continue to research, test, and build more destructive weapons. Isn't it time that we direct our resources and our ingenuity toward creating a future safe from the threat of nuclear devastation? The nuclear age gives us no choice. Unless we do, we will become victims of our own genius. Where do we start? The first essential step is a comprehensive and verifiable test ban, a complete and total halt to all nuclear explosions, both U.S. and Soviet. Science can create designs for new weapons, but without the opportunity to test them, they won't be produced or deployed. Without testing in the 1950s, there would be no hydrogen bomb. Without testing in the 60s, there would be no nuclear weapon so small that we could fit 14 of them in a nose cone or carry one in a backpack. Without testing in the 70s, there would be no neutron bomb, which leaves property undamaged, but destroys all human life. And by stopping testing now, neither we nor the Soviet Union will be able to build nuclear-powered lasers to extend our battlefields into space. A comprehensive test ban is the most effective and verifiable first step in reversing an ever-escalating nuclear arms race. Dr. Glenn Seaborg, Nobel Prize winner and former chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. Well, I, I just feel that we've got to do something to reverse it. Uh, I'm afraid that if we don't, these nuclear weapons are going to be used. I saw one hydrogen bomb explosion, and it's an awesome, terrible sight. A test ban could give and probably would give a technological advantage to the United States by stopping testing now. We've had more than 200 tests uh, than the Soviet Union have had. And uh, we have developed a high degree of, a higher degree of sophistication in our weapons, in my opinion, than the Soviet Union has. The reason I think that uh, we should go in the direction of a comprehensive test ban is because it's so simple. All you do is stop testing. And I haven't found anybody who doesn't understand that. Until this administration took office, every U.S. president in recent history, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, have sought to negotiate a test ban. While the names and the terms of the treaties they signed might sound confusing, the message was not. The spread of nuclear arms must be stopped, and the first step was, and still is, a comprehensive test ban. President Eisenhower, in response to a Soviet-proposed moratorium on nuclear tests in 1958, wrote to Soviet Premier Khrushchev, The United States strongly seeks a lasting agreement for the discontinuance of nuclear weapons tests. We believe that this would be an important step toward reduction of international tensions. There was no testing of nuclear weapons for three years until the Soviets resumed testing in 1961. Anxiety about the growing danger of radioactive fallout kindled a powerful national movement which resulted in the 1963 Test Ban Treaty. It prohibited testing in the atmosphere, outer space, and underwater. 
I now declare that the United States does not propose to conduct nuclear tests in the atmosphere so long as other states do not do so. There's never been a test in the atmosphere or in space by either side since then. This treaty is not the millennium. It will not resolve all conflicts or cause the communists to forego their ambitions or eliminate the dangers of war. It will not reduce our need for arms or allies or programs of assistance to others. But it is an important first step, a step towards peace, a step towards reason, a step away from war. In the limited test ban treaty, we legally committed ourselves to achieve the discontinuance of all test explosions of nuclear weapons for all time, determined to continue negotiating to this end. And every president since has done so in good faith until now. President Johnson outlined a program to halt the nuclear arms race and submitted a draft for a non-proliferation treaty in 1965. President Nixon signed the non-proliferation treaty prohibiting the transfer to other countries of nuclear technology for military purposes and signed the threshold test ban treaty limiting nuclear explosions to 150 kilotons. President Ford signed the Peaceful Nuclear Explosion Treaty, extending those limits to peaceful testing. President Carter pressed for a comprehensive test ban before the United Nations in 1977, and formal negotiations resumed shortly thereafter. In 1982, this administration put a halt to our historical commitment to negotiate a comprehensive test ban. Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger explains why. We think that ratification of that treaty is clearly not warranted, uh, that it would, first of all, cannot be verified effectively. And if we cease nuclear uh, testing, either by a moratorium or by a congressional mandate or a treaty, uh, that that would uh, really injure very severely our security interests. Former arms negotiator Paul Warnke disagrees with the administration position. Stopping testing would make us more secure. As they say, what is security in a nuclear age? Security in a nuclear age is to have an assured retaliatory deterrent. To have the nuclear forces that could survive any sort of a strike by anybody else and still be in a position to wreak unacceptable devastation on the other side. We have that in spades. We'd have that if both sides took three quarters of their nuclear weapons away. What do we gain in our security by testing? I say the only thing that you gain is the illusion that you can fight a nuclear war. And that's a deadly illusion. We are at a point in U.S.-Soviet relations where we can end nuclear explosions. The Soviet Union declared a moratorium on nuclear weapons tests as of August 6, 1985, the anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. They actually stopped testing and pledged not to resume as long as we didn't. Yet in spite of this pledge, the United States continued testing even after the Soviets stopped. And now the Soviets have announced that they will resume testing because we have not stopped. Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger. Uh, and the directors of the uh, National Weapons Laboratories have testified many times that continued testing is absolutely essential and a comprehensive test ban that would, would really undermine the credibility of our deterrent. Uh, our opponents would know that we were not allowed to test. Uh, we would not be able to verify whether they were adhering to it or not, and they violated other treaties rather systematically. Uh, and it would uh, prevent uh, all the necessary modernization, and uh, we think in every way that, or the comprehensive test ban treaty, uh, would have really the opposite effect that its sponsors uh, intend. Quite frankly, I'd like to see both sides lose confidence in the reliability of their nuclear weapons. It would mean a very significant deterrent in terms of first use. We cannot ignore the strength of the Soviet Union, but will more nuclear weapons really make us more secure? Albert Einstein has said that the atomic age has changed everything except the way we think. And yet we still ask the Stone Age question of who is first and who's second. In the atomic age, at some point, the concept of who's first and who's second goes to pieces. 
Rear Admiral Eugene Carroll, Deputy Director of the Center for Defense Information and former strategic weapons planner at the Pentagon, thinks we already have more than enough firepower. As for protecting ourselves, look at the strength we already have. Our military forces are prepared to fight any enemy, any time, any place we might be attacked. We have been planning, arming, training for nuclear war with the Soviet Union for more years than most of us can remember. And make no mistake about it, any war between the United States and the Soviet Union will become a nuclear war, a war without winners. As a result of 40 years of nuclear testing and production, at this moment we could explode 11,500 nuclear weapons on the Soviet Union, and they can explode 9,500 weapons on us. Right now we have over 1,000 land-based missiles and silos ready to deliver thousands of nuclear warheads on any country in the Northern Hemisphere, beginning 30 minutes from right now. Our most powerful deterrent is the ballistic missile nuclear submarine. Our fleet of 37 strategic submarines is hidden in the world's oceans. Right now, on one U.S. submarine, there are at least 160 nuclear warheads aimed at Soviet targets or one H-bomb for every city in the Soviet Union with a population over 250,000. In virtually every field of military technology, America is years ahead of any other nation, from rocket propulsion to navigation guidance, from machine intelligence to telecommunications. We have more than enough military force and weapons to defend our land, our lives, and to help our allies at the same time. Under no circumstances, even a surprise nuclear attack would we lose the ability to launch a devastating retaliatory strike with at least 5,000 nuclear weapons? And yet, with so much military strength, we've been warned over the years about a weapons gap between us and the Soviet Union, warned about the possibility that the Soviets might have more bombers or more missiles than we do. Overall, the United States has a larger and more reliable nuclear arsenal than the Soviet Union. In intercontinental ballistic missiles, the Soviets have an advantage, but on submarine-launched ballistic missiles, the U.S. is in front. And on long-range bombers, we're way ahead. In all, the United States has 2,000 more strategic nuclear weapons than the Soviet Union has. Rear Admiral Jean Larocq suggests that the Pentagon has sent such warnings in order to continue the arms buildup. Weapons. They want to suggest to us that there is a gap in the size of our forces and the Soviet forces. And they suggest that if we can explode more nuclear weapons, we can close that gap. Now, this whole gap business is as phony as a $3 bill. Many members of Congress agree that increased spending will not make us more secure. Congressman Jim Leach, co-sponsor of the House Resolution for a Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. As a Republican member of Congress, I've become increasingly impressed at how many conservative Americans, particularly of Republican families, that are now saying that common sense, business sense, dictates greater concern about the defense budget and greater concern about arms control itself. The test ban symbolizes it all. It is the logic of our times. If you can't have a test ban, you can't have any significant arms control. If you can't have a test ban, you're saying you're going to give up on the issue of nuclear proliferation. The fact is, we can have a test ban. It's within our reach, and it's in our reach in a very time-sensitive way. It can be done soon. House Majority Leader Jim Wright. If we sit here and say, oh, no, we're not going to agree to stop testing new nuclear weapons, even if the Soviets are willing to do so, until first they've agreed to something else. And then they say, oh, no, we're not going to agree to something else until first you're willing to agree to this. There won't be any progress made. And all of our tomorrows will be as all of our yesterdays, lighting fools the way to dusty death. A majority of both houses of Congress voted for resumption of comprehensive test ban talks. By the year 2000, 
Experts say that as many as 15 countries could have the technology to develop nuclear weapons. Nuclear proliferation must be stopped. Today, only five nations, the United States, the Soviet Union, Great Britain, France, and China, have nuclear weapons ready for use in a war. But U.S. government studies have identified a number of other nations around the world which are actively attempting to develop their own weapons, and they cannot build them without testing. Paul Warnke, former arms negotiator. It seems to me that any proliferation of nuclear weapons increases the chances that these weapons can get into the hands of subnational groups or very unstable governments. So I don't want to see anybody get into the nuclear weapons business. I think people ought to be getting out of it rather than into it. Will a test ban work? How do we know the Soviets won't cheat? Is a test ban verifiable? Admiral Jean Larocque, director of the Center for Defense Information. Well, as a military man, I know the importance of accurate verification techniques and equipment. But I know also, from my experience, and from the technology available today, there's simply no way for the Soviet Union to cheat when it comes to exploding nuclear weapons. The equipment we have available for detecting explosions today, scattered all around the world, is simply too good. And besides agreeing to having all of these seismographic stations on their soil, the Soviets have also agreed to allow us on-site inspections. Dr. Jack Everenden, the world's most published authority on verification technology, agrees. Well, the question is, how can we be certain that the Soviets will not cheat on a test ban treaty? The way we will be certain is by deployment of a properly designed and properly dense seismic network, both within and surrounding the Soviet Union. Such a network will require something like 25 stations within the Soviet Union and 15 or so surrounding it. The event, earthquake or explosion, takes place at a particular site, unavoidably generates a set of seismic waves or shock waves which go through the Earth and that are received and recorded by seismic stations, either within the Soviet Union or around the world. Thus, if an explosion should occur within the Soviet Union, it would be recorded at numerous stations. Those signals would be detected, would be analyzed as having derived from an explosion, and proper authorities could be notified that the Soviets had conducted a nuclear explosion. The Soviets accepted our previous provisions with respect to verification. The Reagan administration has suggested that they want more. And the Soviet Union has said, OK, Let's get together and negotiate these further verification provisions. In my opinion, the Soviet Union badly wants a comprehensive test ban. Furthermore, if we had a simultaneous uh, test ban and uh, the Soviets did resume uh, testing, uh, we could resume immediately ourselves. And in the meantime, we would have gained the goodwill of uh, so many countries uh, throughout the world. So I don't see that we have anything to lose uh, by a, uh, a comprehensive test ban and everything to gain. Haven't we reached the point where enough is enough? More and more dangerous new nuclear weapons on both sides only make us less secure. Do we really need a weapon system that will bypass all human intelligence? Putting decision in the hands of computers makes accidents even more possible under crisis conditions. Testing and deploying new weapons is not the answer. Recently, leaders representing six nations from five continents appealed to President Reagan and Soviet leader Gorbachev to refrain from further nuclear testing. They offered to assist in monitoring compliance with a test ban. The American people are showing the same concern here at home. What we're seeing in this country is a movement pushing from the bottom up, from the hamlets and villages and towns of America to Washington. The test ban movement that succeeded in 1963 started in a working mother's living room. One of the women who started that movement in 1961 was Dagmar Wilson of the Women's Strike for Peace. 20 odd years ago, <clears throat> I was a young mother with a job. I'd never done anything political, but except the PTA, if you call that anything political. 
But I got very, very worried about the nuclear testing and the possibility of nuclear war. And I was also indignant because I was only a mere woman and nobody ever asked my opinion about anything. And I called up some of my friends, working mothers like myself. We gathered in my living room one evening because, to my great surprise, they were all as upset as I was. We just never happened to have discussed these things before. To a woman, we agreed that it was time our voices were heard, that we must not leave everything to the men to decide. Well, six weeks after that first meeting, in a great, very, very busy time it was, we were learning everything for the first time, of course. We were learning to operate mimeograph machines. We, we got telephone ears from the communications. We, we learned how to deal with the press. We, we were fearless. We, and of course, because we'd never done it before and we're discovering our, our skills for the first time, we were so excited. I think if we'd had some good advice, we might have been scared to death and we would never would have pulled it off. But in any case, it, was, it only took that long, six weeks, for half a million women to get out on the streets and to demonstrate in 60 cities in front of their state capitals or their uh, city hall or whatever they happened to have and protest the nuclear arms race and say they wanted a test ban treaty. And we made an impression. I mean, we did eventually get a partial test ban treaty. And President Kennedy's science advisor at the time gave a great deal of credit to the women for helping to bring this about. And I like to remember that because it's been a very frustrating time since then, but it makes me believe that if we keep on struggling, we can be effective a second time and a third and eventually maybe bring about an end to the nuclear arms race. The commitment demonstrated by the 1961 test ban movement is even more critical today. What's needed at this point, I believe, is for the electorate to get mad and for the electorate to understand that it bears the ultimate responsibility for our national policies. But the test ban is, a, is definitely a good idea and it should be, definitely be part of any, any sort of uh, end to the nuclear arms race. I remember soon after the war broke out, the second war, somebody stopped me on the street and said, well, there's going to be a war. I suppose you're going to shut up shop. I said, do you ever say to a doctor when an epidemic breaks out, are you going to shut up shop? No, you add to it and you work harder. That's where we are. I am not discouraged, I am frightened. There comes a time when enough is enough. No American would suggest that it would be patriotic to remain in a position of weakness, but no patriotic American can consider that the wisest policy for this country is to continue an all-out arms race. We've come to the point where we have got to begin to back off, and the first logical step is an enforceable joint U.S.-Soviet moratorium on nuclear testing. I just think that uh, patriotism means that you love your country and want to see it continue. And if there's a nuclear war, our civilization and our country won't continue. So I think it's the height of patriotism to be in favor of getting rid of nuclear weapons. The nice thing about a test ban is it's achievable, it's simple, We've done it before. Everybody understands it. It has a terrific impact. And it's winnable. It's winnable if you um, join the fight. The earlier test ban movement was successful. President Kennedy responded by signing an agreement limiting nuclear testing. Today, there is a test ban movement again in the halls of Congress and among the citizens of the world. This movement will be successful when President Reagan responds and signs an agreement to stop nuclear explosions. President Eisenhower once said, I'd like to believe that people in the long run are going to do more to promote peace than governments. Indeed, I think that people want peace so much that one of these days governments had better get out of the way and let them have it. Right now, commit yourself to a comprehensive test ban. Write a personal letter urging President Reagan to put the comprehensive test ban on the agenda for his summit meetings. Don't worry about the details. Ask the president to place the test ban on the negotiating table. Unless we act, and unless our president acts, we cannot achieve a verifiable and comprehensive nuclear test ban. We must take this step toward reason, this step away from war. If you want to get involved, stay with us a moment, and we will tell you how you can help stop 
nuclear testing. We have just seen men and women who support, as I do, a comprehensive test ban. But everyone should be involved. The way to begin is to call the number on your screen. Take the number down in case you can't get through right away. Call. Ask for your own viewer action guide. Whether you want to better inform yourself about the issue, get active in your own community, or join a national group working to end nuclear explosions. The guide tells you how to get in touch with individuals and organizations working to stop nuclear testing, how you can get a video cassette of this program. The guide will provide addresses so that you can contact elected officials. Call. Get involved with me and thousands of others. Thank you very much.